may be seated. Will you join with me in prayer? Creator God, you alone are just and filled with life-affirming mercy and passion. In you, Lord, we find our freedom. This morning, as we come into your presence, we confess that all too often, we don't make following your son, Jesus Christ, the most important thing in our lives. We are consumed by our desire for things we do not have. We long to acquire more money, more clothing, desire fancy cars, the latest electronics, larger home. Lord, we, we confess that we often seek our identity, our security, and our purpose from these things instead of you. We confess our idolatry. And Lord, we ask for your forgiveness. We confess that we often leave your will undone or ignored. And this morning, Lord, we ask that you would help us listen for your voice, that you would help us to find your way in this world, that you would help us to see your hand at work so that we might know what to do. Lord, we give you thanks for your mercy and compassion and the forgiveness that you bestow upon us. And even as we receive your forgiveness, Lord, we turn to offer up prayers on behalf of others. And this morning, Lord, in particular, we stop to pray for the people of the Bahamas, for the unspeakable devastations that they are facing in the wake of Hurricane Dorian. And Lord, we ask that, uh, Lord, that they would receive your comfort, the comfort that comes from your presence and the comfort that comes from knowing that they have not been forgotten. Lord, we give you thanks that here in our country that we have abundance from which we can share to assist our neighbors in rebuilding. We pray for that outpouring of grace that generous compassion that might be poured out upon the people of the Bahamas. And Lord, we also pray for the people of Hong Kong as they continue to protest. Lord, we ask that they would be, that these protests would be peaceful, that they would be productive, and that they would find justice in their demands for democracy. And Lord, we do not forget that there are people in our own country who are dealing with the flooding and the aftermath from Hurricane Dorian. And Lord, we ask that as as neighbors respond to neighbors and as we help one another to, uh, to dry out and to rebuild, we ask that the best of humanity would be revealed in the aftermath of the hurricane. And Lord, we take a short time of silence to pray for those who are sick, injured, or dealing with grief. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, we take time to pray in silence for those who are dealing with emotional and personal pain. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayers. And Lord, we pray for our own deep requests and needs. Lord, in all these things, 
Help us to choose you and follow you, no matter where you take us or how you change us. Set us to your will, even as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you while you are still seated to take out the red hymnals, and let's open up to hymn number 338, Where He Leads Me.
has created us with the capacity to do, to do incredible things. In this world full of ache and loss, we have the ability to be healers, to hold grief, to create art, to tell the truth, to find joy even in times of suffering. And so let us gather together what we have, these sacred gifts and all our offerings, and see what God might do among us as the ushers wait upon us this morning for our tithes and offerings. Creative one, from you we inherit dreams of a world rich in justice and overflowing with kindness. Bless these gifts to work to the work of bringing that world into fruition. Shape us into a community that faithfully discerns your desires for us, that we might be partners with you in the renewing of the world. Amen. You may be seated. morning. Today I'm going to read from the book of Luke, chapter 15, verses 25 to 33, and I'll be reading out of this wonderful old lectern Bible. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him, and the Pharisees and the scribes murmuring, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you having a hundred sheep, he has lost one. One moment. Thank you. You're welcome. Luke 25. Now great multitudes accompanied him, 
And he turned and he said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not hear his own, who does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you is desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and take counsel whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends an emissary and asks terms of peace. So therefore, whoever of you does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciples. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. So this weekend, I, I did a thing. Um, that may not be that great of a thing, but... Um, but I signed up for a bicycle ride. You know, I enjoy riding my bike, and I like to go and, and, and do these, these rides. But I haven't done one in a while. And I signed up for one that is taking place in Santa Inez. Now, I'm doing it because a friend of mine called me up and said, Hey, what do you think? Should we do this ride? And I've done that ride before. Um, and, and I guess one of the things I'm telling all of you this today is that there's a part of it where you tell people you're going to do something that is a little bit beyond you so that you'll actually carry through and do it, you know? Um, but I'm also telling you because in the end, this makes a great framing of this morning's scripture and sermon. You see, when I did this ride before, two years ago, I was in much, much, much better shape. And, um, and that ride was really hard at that time when I was in better shape. So I know what's coming. I know how physically demanding this is going to be. I know how difficult this is going to be. It's 68 miles. We have over 5,000 feet of climbing that we have to do. And I know how much training I'm going to have to put in in order to get ready for the ride. And I know that at this time of the year, I've often said that for a pastor, September and October are the busiest two months of the year. It comes as a surprise to most people, but it's the, it's the reality. Um, and the days are getting shorter, and somehow I have to fit in more training than I have been doing in a long time. So it's a challenge. I know what's coming in, and I know what's in store for me. And when my friend was asking me about this, I wondered if I was up for this. I wondered if I was, I was actually going to be able to do this. But even though I know it's not going to be easy, and even though I know how much hard work it's going to be, I chose to do it. I chose to do it because it's a beautiful ride. I chose it because I enjoy riding bikes with my friend. And I chose it because I need something to get me up off of the couch and get back into my grind of training, right? Right? So even though it's hard, I chose it because I know how awesome it's going to be. So in this morning's scripture, Jesus turns to the crowds traveling with him and he makes that crazy statement that you heard read in the scripture. Whoever comes to me and doesn't hate father and mother, spouse and children and brothers and sisters, and yes, even one's life, they cannot be my disciples. Whoever doesn't carry their own cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. 
We often refer to this passage as the cost of discipleship. In your Bible, it may even have that listed right above that. Um, And I even titled this morning's sermon as the cost of following Jesus. But I believe that if we focus on the word cost, it might steer us in the wrong direction. When we speak of cost, we usually are thinking of a price that we pay, a charge that we fulfill in order to receive an item or an experience. We think of sacrifice. We think of expense. And if we say that the price of admission to following Jesus is a recipe of hate, well, it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to me. It probably doesn't make sense to you. But if we approach this passage under the auspices of choice, well, that begins to change it a little bit. We exert power and control in our lives through our choices. We understand that we find one of the most powerful experiences and expressions of freedom in our power of choice. And in this power, we assume the sum, or we, we accept that we face consequences and the outcomes that are the result of our choices. And psychologists will tell us that, that we actually feel uh, most empowered and most actualized when we consciously wield our power to choose, even when the outcome isn't what we had hoped for or what we had expected. So all of this brings us back to Jesus, speaking to the crowds that are following him. And and this passage happens after Jesus' interaction with the Pharisees during the banquet feast that we talked about last week and the week before where Jesus chastises them about their desire for power, for influence, and wealth. It's after this that he turns to the crowds and says that if they want to follow him, they must be willing to give up all their possession. So it's not just the Pharisees that he's chastising. He's turning around and telling the crowds, you have to be willing to give stuff up if you're going to follow me. And honestly, as, as a guy who lives in Southern California, it doesn't feel good to me. Why would Jesus say something like that? Why would Jesus talk about hating your family? Why would Jesus talk about selling all of your possessions if you want to follow Jesus? And this is where we really need to get into some of the history of this. Remember that we think this gospel was written right around 70 to 75 AD. And this is a time when the Jewish temple in Jerusalem was torn down by the Romans. This is a time when Rome was persecuting Christians. And this was a time when the synagogues were really making sure that the Jesus movement was separate from them. And it's also a time that the church was beginning to define itself as separate from its Jewish root. And what it meant during this time frame is that if you wanted to follow Jesus, you risked being kicked out of your family. You risked losing your inheritance. You risked, well, you were going to be thrown out of the synagogue. And you risked being shunned in the marketplace. And for a lot of the early Christians, they literally had to choose between their family and between following Christ. And for Luke, the message becomes clear. That it's a choice that is worthwhile. It is a choice that is worth making. If we desire to see a world marked with justice and mercy and compassion and peace, then that change begins when we choose to follow Christ. But the choice is yours. The choice is mine. It's a choice that we make. And so this morning I'm asking, why do we follow Christ? Why 
do we follow Jesus? And I think that if, if we were to sit down and really think through it, we follow Jesus because we think that there's something powerful, there's something true, there's something divine in what Jesus taught and in who Jesus is. And we make this choice because we hope to experience and see a world where God is revealed, a world where God is present, a world where God is at work for the good of all creation, in a world where the oppressed and the downtrodden and the forgotten are affirmed for their value and for their beloved status to God. Am I right? I mean, don't get me wrong. Uh, we also need individually to know that we are not overlooked or forgotten. We also need to know there's something waiting for us after we die. But in this passage and in most of his teachings, Jesus is actually talking about this life now, in this passage. The world doesn't change and the kingdom doesn't come unless we are changed and unless our lives are different. And if we're really going to unlock what this passage means, we need to focus on what Jesus means when he says that we have to carry our cross. I mean, what do you think of when you hear Jesus say, you need to carry your cross? Chances are you probably immediately go to Calvary. You think of Jesus hanging there on the cross and being put to death. But we also need to remember that here in the story, here in Luke, Jesus makes this reference and it's before he has made reference to his cross or his crucifixion. So the people who are hearing it are not going to think about Jesus' death. It's going to mean something else to them. And history tells us that Pontius Pilate crucified thousands of Jews in Israel. Crucifixion was a form of capital punishment that the Roman Empire reserved for the enemies of the state. The Jewish historian Josephus, he writes that when people would approach Jerusalem, the roads would be lined with crucifixes, with remains hanging from them. And as the pilgrims would approach Jerusalem, it was a stark reminder of what was in store for anyone who opposed the Roman Empire. When Jesus says, pick up your cross, it means means whole it means that they might have to give up their lives. It means that there's going to be opposition if you choose to follow Christ. See, that's what people heard when Jesus says, you must carry your own cross if you want to follow me. Because following Christ will make you see things differently. It will make you think differently. You will see the world differently and you will adopt values that are different from the empire but we do it. We do it so we can work with God to see God's power, love, justice, and mercy reign in the world around us. Now we live in a country where we're free to choose our faith. Our government has and will continue to protect our right to gather and worship. At least I'm hoping for that and praying for that. The reality is we do not face the possibility of execution simply because we follow Jesus. But the question today to us becomes, what is the cross that we must bear? What is your cross that you must bear? What must you be willing to risk 
in order to follow Jesus? What will you have to give up in order to follow Jesus more closely and more faithfully? Now in our Wesleyan tradition, we don't often talk about it, but there is a a rich tradition of what that means. In, In England, in the middle of the 1700s, there was a whole movement that began to move to come forward. It was the abolitionist movement. And it was a movement to end slavery in the English colonies. And where that cry was coming up was coming up in the Wesleyan small groups that were pocketed throughout the Church of England. And one of those people who received this call was a man by the name of Wilbur Wilberforce, William Wilberforce. And, uh, and, and as he became more prominent in his politics, he began to realize that his Christian faith and in order to follow Christ would mean that he would have to risk his career, his reputation, in order to do what he thought God was calling him to do. And it's a result of some of the work that he did alongside countless other Methodists. Using the song Amazing Grace as one of their rallying cries. And England ended the practice of slavery long before... still have my reflexes. <laughs> ah, I'm alive. But, uh, but long before the United States would, would end slavery, England did as a result of the witness and the work of a people called Methodist. That was William Wilberforce's cross to bear. And he bore it to see good happen in the world. What is the cross that we must bear? What is the cross that God is calling us to bear? That's the question. And I can't answer it for you. It's the risen Christ who stands and says, pick up your cross and follow me. We got work to do. The potter saw a vessel that was broken by the wind and rain, and he saw so much compassion to make it over again. Oh, I was that vessel that no one thought was good. I cried, Lord, you're the potter. storms of life and have searched 
Would you now take a moment to greet those around you and pass the peace? And we've now come to a time of announcements. If you're here for a first or second time, welcome. I'd like to direct your attention to the back of the bulletin. Right at the top, you can find contact information. This is a great way to just reach out to us and let us know how we can be here for you. And you can also see all of the events that are happening this week in our lectionary readings as well. So following worship, you are invited to a time of fellowship right out these doors to my right, your left. For a coffee fellowship, you don't have to have coffee, but there are treats, and it's hosted today by Staff Parish Relations Committee. And the men's fellowship is happening tonight at the home of Roger Ashelman, and I believe it's at 6 o'clock, and they're having a barbecue and asking you to bring sides and desserts to share. There will be a devotion led by Pastor Steve, and I believe just a brief meeting as well. The choir is back in action. If you'd like to join, please attend the choir workshop on Saturday, September 14th, right here in the main sanctuary from 1 to 4 p.m. And the following day is our fall kickoff. So the choir will be back. We'll hopefully have a moment with children coming back again. So bring your kids. And we're going to have a lot of fun afterwards, too. So following worship on the patio, we're going to have a fall kickoff tailgate party with stadium foods. We ask you to bring your favorite non-alcoholic stadium food with you. Um, Just reminder. (laughs) And also we're going to have a photo spot and we're going to have a gourmet on location coffee and tea bar. So make sure to take advantage of that. We ask that you wear your favorite team jersey and just come have a good time and get to know new people and just refresh and reignite your spiritual life. Next Sunday, it's happening. And Pastor Steve's Bible study is back on Thursday evenings, this Thursday in the community room at 7 p.m. And with those things in our hearts and minds, let us conclude this morning's worship service by standing, if you're able. We'll be in the black hymnals, the faith we sing, number 2149, Living for Jesus.
So as you go forth today, may the cross you bear be the joy that emerges in your life as we see the will and the peace and the mercy and the justice of God roll forth. Go in grace.